Hi fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well and that you are staying safe. Since I'm not in a position to review gear right now, I'm focusing on creating some other content for tennis nerd. One example is this interview I did with heads manager for strings and racket accessories, Dennis Fabian. Dennis has an extensive background in the business, he's run stringing operations, worked closely with top players and now he's responsible for Head's strings such as the recently released Lynx Tour and also the Head 3-in-1 machine and their stringing machine. We had a long Skype call about his work, the situation in the tennis world right now and how it is to work with one of the biggest brands in the business. I hope you like it, take care and stay safe. The first question I put to Dennis was how the virus situation has affected his work with Head and his life in general. It's very crazy. I mean, uh, uh, as you can imagine, like uh, it started all in January when when we heard about the the, the virus in in China. So everything got affected over there with the factories and stuff, and we tried to manage through that situation. And then, yeah, like things changed fast, like beginning end of February, beginning March, and um, and they became pretty quick, pretty crazy. I mean. I mean, you, you you know what's going on here in Europe. I'm in touch with, like, for sure, with my colleagues of head in in the U.S. Uh, also with my my friends um, and former colleagues, uh, and they are living in New York, which is like very rough right now for for those guys. Luckily, they live a little outside the city, so they have their houses and and garden and all that stuff. So they are they are safe, safe and and healthy, and so that that's all good. And I think that's kind of the most important message. I mean, luckily for me, in terms of my my personal work, um, as as you know, like I'm I'm more working mainly in the future. Let's say like this. Most of the factories um, that affect my day to day work are are working normal. Luckily, um, so um, I can actually work on on a lot of developments that might come up somewhat in 2022 maybe to end of 2021 depending on how how things develop right now i mean nothing is nothing is certain these days but um i'm sure like head as a company is pretty well set up uh, the executive management team is handling the situation uh, very professional very open with like the employees um we are allowed to go into the office but we follow some strict rules in terms of the distancing and like there are never you are never with somebody else in the office we actually do um, conference calls even in the office if necessary yeah. so no meetings um, we have like all the uh, disinfection stuff in the office and all these so like it's we, we can work from home so like I usually get to the office like maybe once or twice a week um, mm -hmm. following a, like a like a schedule and a timetable so that uh, not too many people are in one floor at the same time so i think that's that's managed really really well and and we will get through this i mean we at, at the end we are tennis players and sports we love sports so like we won't give up uh before the last uh, last ball is hit huh? no of course not no that's uh we, we have to have a kind of a positive stance that's my opinion and just hope that it's do whatever necessary that that it's gonna return back to normal at, as soon as possible. Really, that's what all you can do, you know, and just be sensible. And um, how many people do you are you work there in the office? Well, like here in Kennelbach in the headquarter, like in if if there are normal times, I think in total it's uh, above four hundred people because we have like the sportswear division is in one complex of the building. Then we got the ski department, we got ski production facility, um, like we got the um, prototype and uh, certain racket production still here in uh, in Kennelbach. We got like the tennis divisions, licensing. But right now it's probably down to maybe at the same time these days, maybe 20 people are in the building at the same oh, wow. time. Like just, I, I don't know, like because it's a couple, it's like five, five, store, um, five floors and stuff and, and different parts of the complex. So you barely see somebody right now and that's by intention for sure to make sure that nothing happens um, there is no case here again they are taking really good care of the entire building uh, i don't see a, a huge danger uh, over here i feel comfortable i drive from my house I, d I don't touch anything while driving from my house and going into the office i don't even need to touch anything okay that's great besides my car so um and uh yeah yeah i mean we 
we follow all rules that we have to follow um, to make sure that nothing happens. Really, like the uh, we are, as everyone I think is, we are acting in the best interest that we can get back to normal as quick as possible for personal lives, but also for business. Uh, how is Austria dealing with it? Do you have a lot of cases? I, I don't know the situation there. Um, well, so my case, for example, is also special. I, I like Kennelbach is right at the border of Austria yeah. and Germany. So I live on the German side, actually need to cross the border, which is um, you start realizing how much it became normal that the borders are open. And all of a sudden you got border control again. You need to show your passport stuff i mean that's the last time i think i did this was when i was like 12 13 years old or something like like 25 years ago like at least in europe as you know but uh, here all of a sudden the borders are closed and so i drive across the border every day or not every day but when i go to the office austria is also very strict in terms of like the social distancing uh, they demand right now that you wear a mask if you go into the supermarket um, but actually, I don't. I don't go into any any supermarket uh, here. I have all one uh, closed, and uh, they are also very keen of taking good care um, of people and and making sure that everyone keeps the distance, keeps everything clean. Uh, to be honest with you, like I don't know the situation in other countries right now, but I think it's 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 very let's say professional i don't know if that's the right way a uh, right word to describe but yeah, yeah I, I, have a good, I, I have a good feeling that there will be uh, light at the end of the tunnel at some point like um over here yeah i have i have that feeling too i mean where it's it's sounds like a similar situation although maybe not as strict here but it's uh it's they're, they're doing everything to get back to normal asap and and we can only hope that everyone respects that and and just tries to minimize contact and, and stay as home as, as much as possible, you know. Yeah, that's that's the situation. It's it's weird. I mean, yesterday they announced the cancellation of Wimbledon. I mean, that must be a, have a huge effect on your your company as well and, and uh, you know, the whole tennis industry as such, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's it's for sure it's sad, but and and, and it's it will have impact and and people won't be able to watch tennis on TV or go to tournaments and uh, have have all that kind of experience. It's very frustrating for the pro players too. I mean, they are all sports people. They want to get on the court. They want to perform. They want to compete. Um, nevertheless, I think what's very important to think about as well about those cancellations is always the fact that all those huge events, they have a lot of preparation work. And at some point, I think those events reach a, a point and a deadline where even if they would go back to normal, let's say by tomorrow, uh, probably time would not even be enough anymore to get everything prepared with like the food stands, the, the people from different places in the world because the situation is different everywhere. So at some point, I think they have to have a decision being made. And um, I mean that it hurts and that it will have impact, no question, but rather having it once being cancelled and then going back to normal maybe later in the year and having some good events at the end of the year where spectators can watch and stuff might be the better better solution then so i understand yeah, I, the decision but it's tough it's tough no question no question yeah yeah no i mean it's it's a huge amount of work and also with the traveling situation and everything i mean i can definitely understand that they want to kind of see that if the deadline is, is shrinking it's better to take a sensible decision and, and cancel uh, or like i mean roland garros they decided to postpone we'll see what happens in september it seems like a more feasible date but uh, who knows at this time for sure but there are resilience of discussions going on i mean i mean the french open um, or the the french federation i think they they took their own stance kind of when they they announced the uh, the decision to postpone it and actually pick the date I think that already raised a lot of flags at the uh, ITF, ATP, WTA, whoever is impacted. Um, now you hear certain rumors of like um, that the the US Open get a little bit postponed towards um, like more end of September, beginning of October, uh, in conjunction with like a Miami in the Wells tournament. Um, I think we need to be careful that there aren't too many let's say bad scenarios out there too many rumors i think we need to stay calm and let 
certain people who will take the decisions, let them do their job. Uh, and I think everyone, everyone right now will make sure that they will be able to make the best decision possible considering everyone's interest. And since that situation right now is is new, nobody has lived through this. It's it's always easy from the going from the outside in and say like, well, if they would do this, if they would do this, why haven't they done this? Sometimes we all need to be careful. And especially with like, if you follow social media, certain channels, like, wow. I mean, there are a lot of people that know a lot of things sometimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of generally, my approach has been to try to stay away from news as much as possible, uh, news within quotation marks, I guess, and uh, try to think about other things. I mean, obviously stay up to date with what required and what happens in society, but not sit there and, and stare at Facebook feeds, etc. because I think it only gives uh, out like, I mean, probably a lot of wrong facts, but also a sense of anxiety about the situation. It's just better to try to focus and move on with whatever you can do at the time. I think that's uh, more sensible. I think at least for your mental health, you know. No, I absolutely agree. And I, I think it's it's also very important to consider like everyone is in a different state of mood and, and, and mindset and different places in the world right now, um, depending how the news operate and how they get their reports. And if you are a more positive person, you kind of keep keep dragging on that like, OK, it's going to be become better in July or in June, maybe. And other people who are, let's say, more on the um, less optimistic side, they, they say like, OK, maybe we can't play any tennis anymore during the entire year. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to divide facts and personal feelings. And uh, I think you, you need to read those news or to take it every, every single time for granted what people say. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's move away from this um, talk now and move into um, what you your daily, normal daily life at TED is and uh, <laughs> yeah. what you do there on a regular basis when life is pretty much normal. I mean, you're in charge of accessories, right, which means strings and um, sensors and pretty much everything related to the racket that's not the racket. Yeah, that, that describes it actually pretty well. That's that's how I put it. Like So like the, how the teams are working here is like I'm part of the sales and marketing team um, and we are kind of like the um, connecting department for the communications department or the pro player department and for the R&D department. Um, so we work from our, from our way, we work into the various directions and connect the dots and we try with all those departments, we try to shape the future um, for product, for communications, for everything and and really kind of like yeah work very close which is with each other um you get the different insights from from like the pro player department they will give you feedback of like what's going on in like the junior tennis scene on like the grassroots level club level styles where we are really well connected within the countries up to the higher levels of itf and then for sure on the tour tournaments and stuff they, they will give you feedback there how players change their game, what they are expecting, what they might see in the future. Um, then you get like the insights from the countries that, uh, that get us uh, information about what's expected from retail side. On strings, for example, there's a lot of input coming like on colors or um, certain playabilities that, that uh, certain markets might be even missing or the way they want to see certain tr or where they see certain trends going. And for sure, R&D, and specifically, that's where HET has um, historically always been very strong, um, is like the research part of it. Like, what, what kind of technologies, how can we improve production, how can we work with our production facilities to improve and get better and set new standards and, and, and raise the bar to be really competitive out there. And my job in this um, particular part is, is, as you said, strings, machines, um, the customization machine, like the three-in-one swing weight machine, um, the sensor, um, yeah, and like I'm, I'm looking into into all new things, and and try to come up with something that that is uh, is new, that's unique, that's um, maybe changes the game. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, a lot of things have been done, but uh, we are right now on a good path with uh, certain products for the future. 
that I'm actually working on right now that might be different, better, and and new in how they actually get produced. So one of my go-to strings at the moment is the Link Store, and that's something you've been working on for for how long? How long does it take to work on a new string? It depends. It really depends. It's like very rough to say like, okay, you 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 uh, you need 18 months and you have a final product. Um, the goal obviously is always we we sit down. Uh, we discuss, okay, like, are we either missing something? Um, do we see a new trend? Um, do we, have we found out anything new about uh, um, potential different production uh, ways, uh, new materials? And then, and then we sit down and see what we can do and, and try to figure out in which factory we're going to try to produce certain things. So Lynx Tour was something where we were sitting down and saying like, okay, we got the Hawk franchise with Hawk, Hawk Touch and Hawk Rough. Um, then we got the Lynx franchise and we were like, okay, may maybe there is, maybe we are missing out on a certain trend uh, in in that kind of connecting Hawk and Lynx and, and getting that playability that Lynx um, provides on like a, a very a nice impact feel, a good combination of um, power and and touch, uh, not being too harsh, uh, not being too demanding, um, addressing a broad audience, also attracting a performance orientated player in that level. And um, so we sat down and and talked about what kind of yeah mix of material we want to use, uh, how we want this to play, and. Um, where we can position ourselves for sure. And I think uh, we pretty much nailed it. I'm super happy and super excited about the product. Uh, the feedback is, uh, is is really good out there globally. Um, also on the color, because that's always also a very important uh, part of it. Um, but that's kind of the thought process. But yeah, you can tell like probably 18 months it takes to, to have a final product. When it comes to the color, how important is that to players on a kind of cosmetic uh, level uh, or is it more you know because I mean color is said to have some playability difference if it's you know brighter or if it's darker it's more controlled uh, etc but um, how important is the color for players and why do you think uh, they think it's so important it's always very personal for sure um, there are players out there either pro players or even recreational like like regular tennis players in the countries that um, have more an approach of that they want to have the racket look good. Uh, and for sure, the string plays a big part of it. Um, however, what we experience, no matter, like if the string is outperforming other product, the color doesn't uh, affect the decision process that much. But um, for sure, people are looking for either unique colorways or more new, more neutral colorways. I think like if you if you want to have your bread and butter uh, kind of colorway, you go with black um, or silver gray, which is neutral and it works for pretty much any racket out there. Um, but it's not very distinctive from a marketing perspective. Um, and then I think that's why also like us and also other brands are right now offering more and more color options so we can have a more individual offering. Um, we, we right now with Lynx Tour went with a champagne color because we actually kind of that color was growing on us uh, when we tried it. Um, it is distinctive, but it's not disturbing too much compared to all the racket designs that we have at head and also that are out in the market. Um, and one one thing which is very important, like you can't do blind tests with strings. We can paint the racket all black. We can uh, we can take logos off a tennis ball and have people really blind tested it. But um, strings, it's very difficult. So there will always be an immediate kind of reaction from any player who looks at the racket and sees the color of the string, um, saying, "Oh, that's that's not my color," or "Yeah, that looks good." And it will always have. A subtle influence on how you feel the string. What pe most people say is that if you have a very bright color, it's, it makes the string a bit more lively. And if you have a more dull uh, black, dark gray color, it makes it a bit more controlled. Would you say that's somewhat correct in your experience, or you, do you think it matters? I mean, it depends on the string in general, or? 
Let's say like this, the, the, what you say is exactly the feedback that we usually get, um, specifically on monofilament strings. Yes, the more lighter you go, a little bit more lively, a little bit more powerful, some say, darker you go, they like get a little bit more like settle in and, and a little bit less lively. Now that's correct, but it's, it's interesting. If you, if you just look at the, let's say, proportion of the mix of the material, um, the color percentage, like if you have a hundred percent material where where that that string is extruded off, like the color percentage is somewhat in between zero point eight to one point four percent of that hundred percent. So it's yeah, actually well. kind of crazy if you think about that this minimal amount of um, material has impact on the uh, ninety eight ninety nine percent of the uh, entire material. But it has to do with the molecular uh, structure and all this stuff and the, the heating process and the stretching, the, the temperatures, like everything. So it's, it's from an engineering point, uh, it's, it's actually super interesting how much color can affect um, the, the production. Um, one thing that I also noticed when talking to players uh, all the time all over the world is that the visual aspect of the string is very important, like you mentioned. It's like, that it should look good in the racket. And I think on the Lynx Tour side, that's my personal opinion, is that it, it actually works well in many, many rackets. And I think that's that's a big bonus for a lot of players. I mean, if you have a string that's orange, for example, some players will love it because it, it looks quite you know extreme in a way, and some players will hate it and, and not use it, even if it's a, a good string. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of like the, the fine line and, and like the offering that we need to consider. Uh, sometimes it's good if you have a hate or love it product um, because people talk about it. Just, I'm just talking right now from like a pure marketing standpoint because people start talking about it and you like you get into the chat. More people get maybe curious, even if it if they feel it looks bad, they want to they want to feel it. Um, but like our goal in general is like having a distinctive color in the offering that doesn't offset too many people. And I think that's why we also expanded our color range. For example, in the Lynx uh, string, we, we offer it in red, yellow, uh, blue, uh, anthracite, green. So there, it, it should actually fit everyone. Uh, Lynx Tour um, started with champagne, but like be ready. There is uh, something coming up along the line. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we try to... to, to uh, make people happy with the choices we, we give. Um, when it comes to like choosing a string or creating a string for the market, what would you say is, is um, Lynx Tour's audience? Is it uh, kind of intermediate up to advanced players? I mean, obviously up to the pro tour. Can you as a you know beginner or lower intermediate level use this string? Yeah, so like the, the way we structure our entire lineup of strings is like we have, we, we kind of divide it in, in, into three segments, which is like the, the tour, the performance and the, the team collection uh, somehow. Um, and like Lynx is kind of that, uh, sits right in the middle. It's kind of that performance and performance can be, can be both. It can be, let's say, to the more recreational uh, entry level players, beginner style, if they are ready for a polyester string, which is a different story we can talk about as well, if they should actually choose such a string. And, and it goes up to like, to say like to the more performance orientated player. So I think that that Lynx Tour sits right in the middle of that broad audience of tennis players. So we don't want to, with, with specifically with the Lynx franchise, we don't want to exclude anyone. While the Hawk string is more, the Hawk strings are really demanding and um, high performance strings for a really hard hitting people. Exceptions always excluded. I mean, we like you probably will get comments of like, okay, but like I people will feel this and this. Um, as usual, tennis is a sport that that goes uh, go through personal preference and personal feelings. And I'm always uh, struggling to tell like nobody can tell me what I feel. Rather, can I tell somebody what what somebody else is feeling hitting a tennis ball? Yeah, that's I agree 100%. I mean, working with a tennis nerd a lot and, and talking to players and uh, consulting with players, it, it's 100% true in my opinion as well that it's all about feel and that's why the pros make the decisions they do and what one player 
chooses might not work for the other player or might not work for many other players. It's uh, it's a thing you have to understand what you like and what you feel good about and what you feel connected to. And some players might think a, a string is ultra stiff and some players might think it's very comfortable. It all depends on what they're used to, what kind of arm health they have. And, and so. Absolutely agree. And like, it's, it's actually very interesting sometimes if you, and that's the interesting part if you are the connecting part within different departments, for example, like the R&D guys will tell you that a certain string is like you like just pure from a measuring technical features of a string. It's it could be the softest string ever being tested, and then you're handing it out to like players, uh, even pro players, and you have two different players um, because they play different rackets, different string patterns, different tensions. One will tell you, oh, this is way too soft. Um, like I have no control. I have and the other one with exactly the same string will tell you, wow, this is one of the stiffest I've ever played. And that's where like, you need to consider so many things. W- where did they play? Which racket? Which string tension? How do they hit the ball? How much do they force the string to move? All these stuff. And so that, that makes it so individual um, without, I don't want to make it complicated, but that's kind of where like, consultants like, you do this with a lot of players. We for sure do it with our contracted players. Is like really get to the individual point of what are the expectations of a tennis player, what he wants. And then that makes it so interesting actually developing all those different products. And that, that's also a reason why there are so many choices out there right now. Yeah, I agree to that. I think that's uh, because there's so many different playing styles and you know background histories uh, with players on all levels that it's very tough to do the one size fits all. You really need to have a lot of choice and then find your way by experimentation or getting some expert advice. And I think a lot of players, even on lower levels, they look at the pro players and they look at what they use, uh, what string they use, what tension they use, possibly what customizations they use. And they try to imitate that when that works for that player and not so much for uh, lower level or rec players especially if they're using like a like a really stiff poly string at a high tension where they could use for example a multi-filament um, and i really like you know the head velocity i try to you know really uh, ask people if they're you know only open to using poly strings because for many players it makes sense even on a pretty high level to use a multi-filament string and it will save their arm quite a bit and they will still get pretty decent control it all depends you know how much spin they're generating or you know, if they're breaking strings really regularly. So I think that's it's good that there is some really high quality multi-filaments as well that will save people's arms so they can play tennis uh, longer, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's also, for example, where I'm like what we do at HEAD, for example, we started like two years ago. Uh, we partnered up with uh, Richard Parnell and, and Parnell Knot company and also with the uh, ERSA. And we are in to actually offer workshops around the world for our partners at, at HEAD, for our retail partners, and also for our coaches and, and, and other people um, to, get, to get them more sensitive of making the right selection um, specifically for the string. I mean, um, as you probably can imagine, Germans love a lot talking about cars. So as, as, I'm a, as I am a German, like I love our cars as well. And like the string is kind of the engine of the racket. That's that's kind of a saying, a rough saying that we always use. And like you, you want to have the right engine in, in a high performance racket. Um, and it needs to fit how you are hitting the ball. Um, and I think our, yeah, one of our goals is as well to, to have people well educated because then they will make the right choices if they make the right choices, they will be able to play tennis longer and they will probably also talk more positive about the sport of tennis and get more people excited about tennis rather than being injured and not being able to play. And if this is caused by the wrong choice of the string or tension or bad stringing, uh, bad racket choice, this is bad. And then also we have failed in my opinion. Yeah, I agree 100%. And um, one question I had when, when it comes to the pro players, and uh, I mean, obviously, they're very uh, superstitious and very particular about their gear, which which they should be because it's the one of the few things they can control. Uh, but 
is anyone you know testing this uh, Lynx tour or or you know deciding to use it for the you know season whenever it starts? Uh, do you have any pro players actually committing to the Lynx tour string right now? Um, we we have we have players testing it already since it was the experimental tour. That's how it started. Uh, I, I think there is a story out there that that got out on their own where we even didn't have any influence on because it was done through through a stringer who got uh, his hands on on one of the prototypes uh, i think i don't have to I, I can't and i don't talk too much about it but uh, for example last year's junior us open champion jonas for um he's actually using that string already and he made the switch um pretty much a couple of weeks before the us open last year um, so he's he's one of the more popular ones. Uh, we actually had some discussions in Indian Wells with a couple players that will uh, take their that was prior to the fact that the tournament got cancelled. Um, but um, they will be testing probably after the well, which was supposed to be the grass court season at that time when we discussed. Um, but yes, pro players are always testing. And I think that's uh, something important for the audience to know as well, um, who will be listening to this is we, we get a lot of questions of like, uh, is the player like switching to that string? Who is switching? How much influence do they have? Uh, we have our pro players are extremely supportive of giving their feedback. And I think what's important to know is like the way they hit the ball, none of us can really hit the ball. Um, they force the string to move in a special way. And so their feedback for all the testing we do is extremely important. And they really give a very um, detailed feedback on it, which doesn't mean necessarily that they always make a transition or switch to that new string. Because as you say, some, some players are, it's individual. Some players are super open. They will try it out. Uh, others are superstitious. They don't want to change anything. And again, I'm, I'm struggling to, to tell somebody right or wrong. It's, it's personal, it's individual. I think that's very important. Yeah, exactly. And some, some players are definitely more open, but I, I, I completely understand that the feedback from the pro players is, is very is key to, to your developing uh, products. And, and it's, it's also good. It's a good reminder for most you know, mere mortals that hit the tennis ball that it, if you're a pro player, it's a completely different ball you're hitting. Um, if you've hit with one of the pros, you, you would know, you know, because it's it's a completely different level of tennis and they have different requirements on durability, control, spin and so on than most recreational players have. Uh, so I think that's an interesting, interesting outtake. When it comes to, uh, I wanted to talk a bit about your other products as well. Um, for example, the, the sensor or the three in one machine. Um, are you doing more work on the sensor and what has the you know feedback been? Uh, you know, it's it's been a product that's been in the marketplace uh, sensors in general, I guess, for you know five, ten years. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, I'm I'm keen to hear if you get any feedback you can share, or if there's any more developments in that um, area. Yeah, I mean, we we try to con constantly like improve uh, the products and and look into what we can can do better. Uh, the sensor was uh, back then developed in conjunction with uh, with Zap a company. Uh, that company got actually, it was a startup that got acquired by a huge corporation called Wami out of, out, out of China. Um, we are in, in good discussions with them to keep uh, this product um, going and also developing new features that we, uh, that we want, would love to see. Uh, we are still in a phase also where we try to like kind of consolidate feedback because it's pretty interesting, like depending on which audience you talk to, um, you get different feedback of what the features are people are expecting. And um, that's where we try to channel this a little bit um, more diverse in, in terms of what, what, what's next to come. Like, is it a, a coach application that goes within the sensor where academies can track all their players and their performances? Uh, is it more a, a videotape option where people can connect the sensor to their phone and videotape um, themselves playing and all this stuff and then analyzing their swing? Um, like all those kind of things. So we are we are thinking about it. Uh, we are trying to improve it. Uh, we are trying to improve um, the, the hardware even uh, because as you know, like our sensor is the first one that kind of doesn't change the racket in terms of 
weight balance and, and all that stuff. And I think we, we set a pretty high standard and high bar um, with, with, that, with that product. And, and now it's on to the next level. Hopefully, once this is over here uh, in this world, that we can, can show people um, a couple more features and some news. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very interesting product. It's something I, um, I I like using as well. And I think, I mean, on my personal level, just throwing out ideas, I think something that could be interesting for a lot of players is is kind of this self-analysis uh, function, partly because I do it myself, but I also see the need from a lot of players that when you videotape yourself from the back or you videotape other players and they will see themselves, they have no idea you know, what they're doing on the tennis court until they see themselves on, on camera. And I think if you could kind of trace the swing path, etc., you could kind of find uh, problems in their forehand, backhand, whatever, uh, and, and help them. And that could be an interesting kind of coaching application or self-coaching application because a lot of people can't afford maybe going to a, a coach, although that's a great idea if you're going to a good coach, but it might be expensive. So I think anything that could, you know, help people identify their own mistakes would be very interesting uh, as a product, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what, what our goal back then also was that we would we wanted exactly we wanted to address that kind of fact that we wanted to respect the coach on, on, on the one hand. At the same time, we wanted to give uh, people the opportunity to practice by themselves. So like a lot of coaches and uh, a good feedback that we are getting is that coaches are actually using the sensor in special lessons. And, and then they kind of send people back with certain exercises and then they track it with a sensor and then coaches review um, the stats with the student. And I oh, think that's, that's something that, that's, that's going along the way. For example, we have a collaboration with uh, Robinson, the, the, um, the, the um, vacation um, destinations. And uh, they offer actually... Um, they offer actually those trainings like you can book a court with a coach where they use the sensor and then they look into your stats give you individual advice advice and all that stuff so um, that's what i mean that's where we try to consolidate the feedback of like what can we do next and, and how can we improve it um, maybe people have been expecting more and quicker but like we we took the approach of like we want to do it right um, and not quick <laughs> let's say like this if we can do it right and quick, it's even better, but like it's difficult for sure. Yeah, it's, an, it's a kind of a new product as well. It's been relatively flesh, f fresh in the marketplace. So I think it, it's hard to expect too much from these things uh, quickly. But it's something I really like to follow up on because I think that any kind of analysis tool, especially when you're testing various rackets and strings, could be, could be interesting, of course. Um, and the three-in-one machine is something I, I'm using, obviously, as, as a tennis nerd on an almost daily basis. And um, how's the, the, you know, the the process been there? I mean, are you working on updates or are you seeing interest? I mean, it's more of a kind of a pro shop tool, I would I would guess. But uh, it's, I'm still interested in the in the kind of evolution of that product. Um, like the demand is actually pretty high globally um, because right now we are one one, if not the only company that actually um, is selling, let's say, the combination of all three um, parts in, in one machine. Um, so like, but yes, we are also working on, on an update. Um, there is something there is something in the pipeline which isn't ready yet, but uh, and I also can't talk about it. Um, but um, it, it might it might get some additional features in the future that uh, make it even more more special and unique um, of what you can measure on on tennis rackets and and uh, be even more individual. Uh, we are we are myself and our R and D team are, are, are looking into this. Oh, that's interesting. And, yeah. And what you said, like it's it's like I'm always struggling because a lot of people are saying like, oh, this is more for professional players and like if they want to do big changes to the racket and the specs. But I think it's also very interesting for let's say the normal team player in a tennis club to have good well measured individual uh, product um, even if they change the grip or anything like it can change the specs and stuff and if somebody can measure the racket um, adjust it um, get one or two two grams here or there um, 
you can look into like a, a performance increase even on on the uh, and I don't want to sound disrespectful, but on the lower level uh, or on the average level, it's always tough to find the right name for for those players. Recreational is not the right name. Uh, beginners is not the right name. But I guess the audience will know who I'm talking about. Like the the us, uh, I consider myself as well, like the tennis nerd, tennis fan, tennis player. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it, it's useful for a lot of players, and I actually get a lot of questions about the machine uh, on social media and so on because players are really keen. Obviously, it's not me. I mean, tennis nerds in general who like to kind of collect rackets or, or uh, tweak the rackets and, and test a lot of rackets. There's a lot more people doing that than I've ever thought. And um, so they obviously are interested in machine, but there's also from other people that are starting to kind of get their eyes more open on uh, how much like a few grams here and there actually you know makes a difference in your racket and i think that's that's the interesting part because it also if you if you're playing you know like junior tournaments or you have some ambitions to play competitive i think to have like two three four matched rackets is very important where people don't realize like if you have two rackets one might play differently from from the other one even if you string it at the same with the same string and at the same tension so there should definitely be a, a, an interest in this type of machine no ab absolutely I, I totally agree with you and, and that's that's exactly the case and that's why we kind of brought it to market and that's why we are looking into even making it a more precise machine um, for example right now you need to read the balance by your with your eye um, maybe there's uh, room to improve um, maybe we can become more precise here just to tease in some things we are talking or like looking into. And, and, and again, like that's also a reason why we um, started to offer the workshops in conjunction with like the stringers organization and probably was one of the best stringers out there or one of the most experienced for sure was Richard um, to get um, people more sensitive about how important um, this part is as well for your game. When it like comes Richard, to, yeah. Richard, Richard always loves to say like um, a stringer can make a player win a game and he can also make a player lose a game somehow um, with like a bad string job. Yeah, I agree completely. And I was it was very interesting to, to have a sit down with Richard. Uh, I did that earlier, uh, not this year, but maybe last year. And I mean, he obviously has a massive wealth of, of experience in, in stringing and understands exactly how it can influence um, uh, a player's results, etc. You also work on stringing machines, I guess. And um, how many models do you have on offer right now? Right now, there's one uh, one machine out there um, on the let's say mid price point. I think it goes retail uh, in around four thousand euros uh, for uh, retailers. Uh, but we have uh, individual like country depending uh, special programs for our pro shops and for our partners. Um, our goal was to have like a machine that's uh, easy to handle and is reduced to the, let's say, basis of, of doing a, a good string job. So like high quality materials. Um, we didn't go too fancy with all that stuff. So people can really maintain the machine by themselves very easy. Um, not too many things that can get damaged and that can uh, take you away from the machine uh, because you need to exchange or, or whatever. Uh, and here we are looking into like some improvements as well for the future. Uh, we got our first prototype being tested um, during the Indian Wells tournament, but we are probably like two years away from from introducing something new. Well, but you're a quite uh, experienced stringer yourself, uh, right? You've been stringing at some tournaments. Uh, yes, like I, I well, before I went, let's say, into the industry, I was a tennis coach by myself. Uh, I also had a pro shop and did a lot of customization and stringing also for some some tour events. And uh, when I when I entered the industry, I was also responsible to organize a lot of stringing services. Like, for example, I was responsible for the stringing services in, in Halle, Westfalen at the Grass Court Tournament, uh, Atlanta, the tournament, Eddie Herr, which is one of the biggest junior tournaments in the world. Um, like we did last year, for example, we did Hamburg in, in, in uh, Germany, like the ATP, it's a 500. We do Indian Wells, um, Paris, Bercy, Madrid. So like I'm, I'm in touch with like, let's say the Stringer and Stringer's community 
a lot and consider myself a, as well as as a, as a stringer and I always try our product and, and test those kind of machines uh, all the time. Like right now, I'm I'm looking at, at, at two stringing machines in my office here um, that I'm trying different things on. It's nearly 13 years ago that I made the transition into the industry. So let's say I have seen tennis from all the different angles uh, that you can can look in, at tennis, and it's it's my life, it's my passion, it's what I do for like whatever. You you need to remove me here actively to get me out of tennis <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh, do you have any any fun memories to share from your uh, career in, in tennis oh there are probably a lot like how much time do you have but like uh, it depends on what you want to hear there are there are a lot of lot of fun stories um, like the the great thing on tennis is that it's a global sport uh, you you get to see you get to know uh, a lot of different people a lot of different characters and particularly in my my job and in my roles that I have been uh, through in my career, like um, I'm connected to the nerds, to the stringers, to the pro players, to coaches, to retailers. So like that makes it super interesting if you if you hear all the different opinions um, out of their individual perspectives and and. Our challenge is always like get this consolidated and making the right decisions on product. Uh, which is which is challenging, but also exciting. Yeah, it must be a very exciting uh, work uh, behind the scenes there. And uh, I, I guess you also travel to uh, a lot of the tournaments and um, not only for stringing, but I guess player relations and stuff. Do you do that as well? Um, yes, um, less. Um, let's say like in, 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 when I was working at Prince, I was responsible for quite some time for um, the entire athletes and and have worked really close with players like like uh, John Isner, Brian Brothers, um, Lucas Pui, David Ferrer, uh, and and the likes of it. Uh, also with some very good good juniors back then. We had the number one junior in the world with Marte Valkush uh, back then under contract. Uh, so I was working with them when I made the transition to head. Like um, the company is a little bit different structured, so we have a an extremely successful and, and very experienced pro player department. Um, and for sure, we knew each other from, from, from the tour when I was working at the other brand. And um, yeah, we, we have built up a really good relation here. And so we are working really close, um, but those guys are, are um, in the lead and, and working directly with the players. And if, if my input or if that's it's needed like i'm also working with them and and visit players or uh, talk to the players directly but like then it goes really down deep into the string development i mean i mean our our pro player uh if you if you look at it what what they have delivered over the past couple of years this is success is tremendous so um i mean we have one of the best ever played the sports on the contract some of the best prospects uh, under contract. So it's, it's exciting to, to work with those guys for sure. Yeah, it must be, it must be. Uh, what, uh, may I ask what racket and strings you use yourself? Um, I'm actually, uh, right now, I'm mainly hitting with the Gravity MP. Um, I love the 1620 string pattern. Um, it's kind of um, like I grew up with 1820 actually and like a 98 square inch racket or and um, then right now I'm more to, leaning towards that 1620, um, a little bit more open, a little bit more easy to play, um, but I customize the frame a little bit and I play uh, Lynx Tour actually. Lynx Tour and one prototype I can't talk about, but it's gonna be exciting. Cool, um, I'm excited to, to try it when it's released. No, it sounds like a good setup. I'm also a fan of the Gravity uh, line of rackets and the MP with some customization is, is a top-notch frame with the, uh, uh, like you, I'm also a fan of the 1620 string pattern. It's one of the most underrated patterns, I think, uh, in a way. Uh, well, that was, uh, was a very nice talking to you, Dennis. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me in this uh, moment in history that we're living in. And um, if you have anything else you want to share around head or or yourself, uh, please do. No, thank you. Thank you for for giving me the opportunity to talk to you and talk to your audience. And yeah, I mean, once you once you um, 
kind of uh, making the interview public. Like if people have any questions, like uh, specifically right now, maybe people have more time to look into what they ever wanted to know, um, ask them and uh, I will be more than happy to reply. Uh, maybe I can't reply to everything, which is probably understandable too, but I would uh, do my very best to be as open as I can be. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sure the tennis community will have a lot of questions. That's what I encounter on a daily basis. And it's, it's always fun to connect to, to uh, players all over the world, but it's, it's sometimes it's a lack of time for, for one person to reply. But that's also my ambition is to, to reply as much as I humanly can. But uh, yeah, thanks again, Dennis. Uh, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And I wish you all the best and that you stay safe in this time, right? Same for you and same for everyone out there. And uh, stay home, huh? Be careful. Take care, Dennis. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.